we put on the internet, so be aware. <laughs> um, we, as digital natives, one of the things we look at is how young people are being civically engaged, uh, particularly in online spaces, so we are particularly excited to have Alison Fine here presenting um, Social Citizens, Millennial Activism in the Connected Age. Allison is a social entrepreneur and writer dedicated to helping grassroots organizations and activists successfully implement social change efforts. She's a senior fellow in the democracy team at Demos, a network for change and action in New York City, um, where she researches and writes about the future of social change and civic engagement in this new digital age. Allison's also the author of the book Momentum, Igniting Social Change in the Connected Age, which uh, was the winner of the Terry McAdams National Book Award and was published in 2006 by Wiley and Sons. Uh, and here at Berkman, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this May, 15th and 16th, uh, is the conference and gala, so register at Berkman at 10.org. Um, and we're also giving away $50,000, so nom nominate um, people that are eligible for the Berkman Award on our website. And with that, I'll turn it over. Do we want to do an introduction? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh? If we, yeah, if everybody could just go around and briefly introduce. Can I start? Yes. Robin Farris, Berkman Center. You were practicing that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. For go more on, years on. than you can imagine. <laughs> Stuart Comstock, yeah, I work at Demos. Uh, Becca Tabaski, Berkman Center. Scott Sider, School of Education. Catherine Bracey, Berkman Center. Karen Shaw, UC Berkeley. Betty Isaacson, Harvard Training School. Uh, Tim Wong, I'm an undergraduate. John Klobuchar, fellow Berkman Center. Andy uh, Walter, Berkman Fellow. Amar Asher, Berkman Staff. Maya Marshall, Berkman Intern. Paul is a good enough Berkman Center. Uh, Oliver Baden, uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, I'm Harry Lewis. I'm a computer science professor here at Berkman Fellow. Drew Bettling, Berkman Center. Josh Goldstein, Fletcher School and Berkman Center. Elias Berkman, Harvard Law School. Stephanie Miao, I'm a fellow at Schroeder. Sundar Chatterjee, I'm a fellow at the Center. Gene Koo, also a fellow. Pablo Marquez. Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. Kevin Korzneski, Harvard Law School. What an interesting array of folks. I'm Allison Fine. It's nice to be here today. Mostly I'm delighted that uh, it's not an April Fool's joke by Emmer, uh, who invited me. So <laughs> I'm glad that we're here. I wanted to talk to you today about a paper I've just finished for the Case Foundation. That's the Family Foundation of Steve and Jean Case. Uh, they wanted me to take uh, a look at the intersection of uh, millennials, and we define millennials as 15 to 29-year-olds. There are lots of different definitions out there. Or, in other words, uh, people who went to college with laptops. That's how you'll know who they are. And their intersection with uh, social causes. Momentum was a broad look at the social sector writ large and how it needs to uh, uh, move to adopt to the new Web 2.0 world, to the new digital world. But this was a narrower view of what exactly is happening just in this uh, realm of young people, technology, and social change. And uh, just to give you a quick overview, I want to talk a little bit about the millennials and why they're so important, a little bit about the cause society that we're living in, which is very important, and when you put the two together, we came up with something that I call a social citizen. That is somebody who cares passionately about causes, is very immersed in the technology, and has a totally different view of their role in a larger community than traditional uh, citizens would have, than say a greatest generation of citizenship would have. So millennials are important because they are enormous. There are over 70 million of them. They outnumber the living boomers, which takes people a bit by surprise. They are, as you know, as we all know through the Digital Natives program here, they are immersed in technology, fluent in it, born to it. Not every single one, but um, uh, largely. Um, and they're living immersively. When, by that, we mean that they are fluidly moving from online spaces to online spaces taking their social networks with them, and using tools uh, in both places to connect themselves to uh, peers, to information. And from my perspective, what was important was to causes as well. Now, we know that they're multitasking. 
and we were just, Miriam and I were just chatting before, that it's very easy if you didn't grow up that way with, you know, 14 IM windows open and uh, emailing and chatting <laughs> all at one time. It can look uh, a little dispiriting and a, a little dizzying. Um, but I think our challenge, uh, particularly as people who are trying to make sense of this new world, our challenge is to look at it as the way the world is going, not as a good or bad thing, not to put our values on it, but simply to say this is uh, how young people are living and it's affecting uh, what they do and how they do it. But just as importantly as multitasking is what I would call their multi-context view of the world as well. So using the same tools and the same energy blended throughout their life, kind of striated throughout their life, are all the different worlds that they're living in and all the different areas of that world that they're living in. So, for instance, they're doing their schoolwork and they have their school networks. And uh, at the same time, they're immersed in entertainment culture, which is a good thing. I'm not opposed to that. And at the same time, um, they're immersed in their own social world and in causes, all using the same tools. Now, something very interesting that I learned through my research, and this uh, came from a scholar at UC Santa Barbara named Jennifer Earle. Uh, she's working on what she calls social movement societies, is that you find that they're using the tools of democracy to, uh, in, in, these, in all of these different contexts. So they're using um, organizing tools to make their voices heard in uh, schools and on campuses. They are protesting the decisions that entertainment companies are making. So they're petitioning and using protest tools and emailing and boycotting and boycotting, all of these wonderful tools of democracy, uh, which is to say that we may not see them engaged in demonstrating on the steps of the Capitol right now, but it doesn't mean that they're divorced from how to engage democratically, which I think is very, very important for our future. And the last thing about millennials that I found really, really interesting was um, how drawn they are to corporations as consumers. There are large consumers. They are very comfortable in expressing themselves with corporations of how they want corporations to behave of the fact that they want to buy from socially responsible corporations. I was uh, just saying before, socially responsible, the label socially responsible has become to me a little bit like organic food in that just about anything fits under it right now. I'm not quite sure where the parameters are anymore, but buying something where either that something was made um, in a healthier uh, way or that that company gives back in some way, say a Ben and Jerry's um, or the Red Campaign that so many corporations joined, are likely to draw millennials to them. And that's very, very important because what's left out of the equation, so they're drawn to their social networks, they're drawn to causes, they're drawn to corporations, they are not drawn to government and public policy. And this is very important. We do see, and it's possible we're in the midst of, a sea change of engagement politically that's starting with the presidential campaign this year. We're seeing a surge in young voters. However, to date, we don't know how the story's going to end, but to date, we know that young people are drawn to campaigns, whether it's advocacy campaigns or increasingly political campaigns, that's still not the same as understanding and participating in the development of public policy and in the running of government. Those are still very different things. So that's who millennials are. Why don't we talk for a little bit, uh, just for a second, about the cause society. So we are living in a society that is immersed, I call it, marinating in causes. You cannot go anywhere. I was in the, you know, several airports last week. You can't go in an airport. You can't go in a mall. You can't walk down a street. You can't open up a newspaper without seeing some uh, a cause that we're supposed to give to, click for, connect to, donate to, volunteer for, uh, from our very first immersion into schools, through schools, in congregations, in companies, in corporations, throughout our lives, there are causes. It's a reflection of the fact that the number of nonprofits have almost doubled 
in the last 15 years. The amount being given to nonprofits by individuals and foundations has exploded at the same time. And the third leg of the cause society is the fact that we have taken out civic education from public schools and inserted <coughs> volunteerism and serve and learn, right? This is now the de facto way of defining citizenship in many ways, although these are largely private activities, which is very interesting. So you take, you know, one of the most uh, cardinal examples of causes over the last 15 years is the Susan Komen uh, Race for the Cure, right? This has been a magnificent example of bringing awareness to a cause of breast cancer involving millions of people as uh, runners and participants and fundraisers. They have donated billions of dollars to breast cancer research. But here's the difference. Old school activism or advocacy, those that money would have been uh, public money going to NIH for research. Coleman is investing in private research. So we've privatized advocacy and in that case, uh, public health research as well, which is a really interesting idea. So you put all these pieces together, and we have millions of young people walking around as what I would call social citizens. <coughs> these are people who view their sense of participation in communities larger than themselves, in issues larger than themselves, solely through this cause lens leaving out government and public policy. They understand the need on, say, Facebook to connect to a cause and to friend for causes, to fundraise for causes. But here the model takes a right a, or a left turn, a different turn away from traditional uh, advocacy and activism. My background is as an evaluator of social cause efforts. And what happens in those in evaluating advocacy efforts is a very linear, very traditional manufacturing model, right? So you have inputs and activities. Those are the things that are going around, going on in an effort, and they result in outputs, maybe the number of people who were who participated in a cause, and outcomes and impact. What happened as a result? Traditionally, for advocacy, the outcomes and impact are around public policy development. To date. When we're watching social citizens, particularly on uh, online, uh, participate in advocacy efforts, the end result is around process. It's around um, raising awareness and having people participate. It is not about public policy. So based on all of that, um, I have questions that I came out of this effort with which I guess is a really good thing, because it means that it's both nascent, it's all brand new thinking, and it's interesting. You know, we have things to ponder, which is good. It means none of us are out of work, which is even better, right? <laughs> so the first area that um, I was, um, I'm intrigued by, and uh, if you ask me more about it, the answer is probably, gee, I don't know, it's so nascent. So <laughs> expect that as an answer, is this idea of having uh, a citizenry that excludes public policy from its thinking about public solutions. And again, I don't want to define it as a good thing or a bad thing. Just we know to date, young people have not uh, been included in decision making for uh, with government. They have a difficulty having access to it. Dana Boyd writes eloquently uh, about that. Um, and so they're, the lens that they look at for social change uh, excludes public policy, which is important. Uh, the second issue that's very important is we know that connecting through social networks, particularly online, is uh, a way of uh, creating an identity and uh, acculturating oneself for young people. Uh, the question, though, is for uh, very difficult public problems. We're going to need to cross, um, uh, to, to connect across these uh, bubbles. And that is very difficult to do. I don't know that it can be done solely online. It probably needs an on-land component to it. Uh, but we really have not figured out good ways of combining those efforts 
to efficiently and effectively bring people with disparate points of view together to problem solve. And the last uh, issue is um, the fact that these efforts are so nascent and are so fundamentally different than uh, activism and advocacy from last century. And I think they deserve and require uh, new measures and new measurement systems to go along with it. And uh, again, I don't know exactly what those are, but I think they're worth pursuing. So I know that the intent of the lunch is to have a conversation. And I'm going to leave off right there and join you to um, converse with me. Thank you. Anybody? Uh, sorry, Hi. Um, or maybe you could say a little bit more about the method that you use. I'm very interested yeah. in the conclusions that you drew, but I didn't get a sense of sort of what the the yeah, it was it was largely qualitative. Um, it was the, the core of it is about 30 uh, in-depth interviews uh, that I had with uh, both uh, key influential people who've been thinking and writing about this, as well as millennial activists uh, who were very very interesting in so their view of the world. Um, uh, ben Rattray, who started Change.org, uh, was one. Um, uh, Thaddeus Ferber, who runs the Youth uh, PAC, uh, is another. Um, I've just lost this. Adrian Talbot, who started uh, Generation Engage, uh, is another. And there were several more like that. So these are young people who have uh, started um, activist efforts largely online. Mm -hmm. um, who brought a very different and interesting perspective uh, to it. And then there was a literature review as well that went with the study. Yeah, hi, Jane. Hi. So my partner runs a grassroots organization, which by the definition of the Cape Foundation is primarily comprises millennials, 20-something yeah. uh, uh, folks. She and I are both not in that category. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, group, the, the kinds of folks she worked with are uh, mostly evangelical Christians. And so for a while, she attributed this kind of aversion to policy to to, to that factor rather than to their age. And so I find that, that really interesting. Um, hmm. And uh, that maybe it's actually not just their evangelical makeup, although evangelicals do have more aversion to participating in public policy than other religious groups or non-religious groups. But uh, I'm, I'm curious if in your research you, a lot of the amount of activism through Zoom, kind of progressive activism, which actually her group is, but there are also um, a lot of, of young people who are engaged in, um, you know, I mean, what you might call conservative causes or whatever. Yeah. And I'm curious if, if we're finding spans the ideological spectrum. Yeah. Um, uh, they do. Uh, we were trying not to just be uh, left leaning, uh, although there's an awful lot of activity uh, happening on the left. One thing I found very interesting about millennials as, as a group, and of course it's a generalization, but as a group, I didn't find them to be very ideological. They're not at the extremes. They're idealistic, which is very different. They strongly believe that they can and will make a difference in this world, but that difference is going to come from a hammer in their hand. Uh, it's not going to come at a ballot box. They're also very different from boomers, and boomers in particular, uh, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. We don't really have a characteristic, so <laughs> I'll talk about the boomers. Boomers in particular in that boomers have a relationship to government. It's mostly that they dislike it, right? That's what they were protesting in, in the 60s about was they were protesting against government. Uh, in the research out of uh, Circle uh, at the University of Maryland, Peter Levine has done a tremendous amount of research in looking at the political affiliation of young people and the, their feelings about government. And what he found, which is really interesting, was they're not against government. They're not particularly for it either. They're sort of neutral in, in the middle. They just don't have a relationship with it, which is actually an opportunity uh, for people who do want, who do think it's important that they uh, think about and affect public policy. The opportunity is that we don't have to start from a negative. We do have to engage and educate and inform and activate, but at least we don't have to overcome 
uh, an enormous amount of skepticism or cynicism. That's not what the, what the issue is. So I think, you know, with your partner working with evangelicals and whether it's, a, it's an evangelical issue or a millennial issue, I think there is um, a core of people who frankly have never seen government work particularly well at a local or national level <clears throat> and have just closed it off as an option because where they have been successful is they have clicked on causes, they have run for causes, uh, they have bought from green companies, and they see that working. It's right in front of them and it's instant. <clears throat> I want to go back to what the difference you made between ideological and idealistic. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways in which I think that difference plays out is also in terms of group orientation and individual orientation. So with ideology, it seems that people can get behind some ideology and move together. But if in your paraphrasing of idealistic, you said, I believe I can make a difference, and that seems a bit more individualistic. So did you see those kinds of different orientations playing out as well? I think, I think that is just right. Uh, I think that their, um, their understanding of how they make a difference is, uh, is individualistic. They are happy to work with other people on causes, um, but don't necessarily see that as a community of people as opposed to if they had uh, a view that the government needed to work very differently <laughs> and how you would need to mobilize voters and protesters to do that, that would be a very different sort of engagement. Uh, I think my comment about ideological also uh, references the fact that they are not, um, they're not radical in any way. They're very happy to participate in this free economy. They want to start businesses that are socially responsible. So they're not 1930s socialists and communists. You know, they're very mainstream in, in the causes and issues they take. Um, is there any reason to think that some of this has to do with their loss of patience with the written word? Hmm. Just to say, you know, ideologies and radical philosophies and so on have, you know, traditionally emerged from things people write that get people, you know, fired up and then you sort of, you know, struggle with to carry through the consequences and some people that carry them to carry them through. I was very struck by the thing you said at the beginning, which never occurred to me, although I've observed it. And now that you say it, it's obviously mm -hmm. true, which was always the, <clears throat> the I, I say that in a very, uh, in order to give you some credit for observing it, that uh, civic education has been replaced by, you know, volunteerism. And the same thing that this, um, that the way the idealism has displaced, uh, you know, ideology is is is, uh, is to sort of individuate the, um, you know, the relation with social cause rather than you know, kind of, dare I say it, think about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's maybe too too harsh, but we got to get the juices flowing in the room here a little bit. Now. You were you were so wonderfully dispassionate and balanced in your presentation, uh, and uh, you know, so I wonder if this is, if this is in any way related to some of the uh, sort of, uh, you know, attention deficit phenomena that, that you also alluded to mm -hmm. at the, you know, at the, at the beginning that, uh, you know, that kids don't spend their time being forced to read things and think hard about where the arguments take them and they just want to jump in and are now able to. That's the, that's the, right. the, the, you know, the, the democratizing force of the tools that they now have available, which, you know, people didn't used to have. Well, I have, a, uh, I have a series of reactions okay. for you. The first being, of course, that um, I constantly tell my children that anything I say is obviously true. And uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to go over so well there, but <laughs> I'm glad you agree. <laughs> um, I think that what I saw in the research was that these are children, millennials are children of boomers. And they grew up hearing this story I about. Know some of them, actually. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're all lovely. You know, they are. They're wonderful. <laughs> um, they grew up hearing stories about protests, many of which ultimately didn't work. And what I read about was this feeling of, well, that's the way that you tried it. We're not going to do it that way, right? Because you you were out in the streets and you didn't actually stop a war, and you were trying to change society in this very radical and, and um, 
uh, ideological way, and that didn't work, and you gave up. And so I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to find causes that s speak to my heart, and I'm going to pick up a hammer, and I'm going to go to these places. This is huge, too. I want to go to these places, and see, I want to go to New Orleans. I want to go to Guatemala. I want to go and see it and feel this change, the difference that I'm making with people. And I don't know that that uh, can be ascribed to just having uh, an attention uh, d deficit. And I don't know also that it's entirely fair to put the onus just on young people for rethinking uh, democracy and government as well. Stu? I, you know, I want to pick up on some of the same points. Uh, there must be a generational thing. We <laughs> resonate with some of the same things. <laughs> but your point about replacing civic education mm -hmm. with volunteerism uh, was also the point that probably struck me most in the whole thing. And that's not just <clears throat> the millennials saying we want to behave differently. It's the boomers saying we're going to teach you differently than we were taught. Yeah. And so what's the message about that, that the boomers have said, you know, all that stuff about civic education, we're not going to teach you about government. We're not going to make you, you learn the details about the muck and mire of how government functions and doesn't function. We're going to do something that's easy. And so I, I'd well, love I to think there's also, I don't think we should shy away from the fact that there's a political component to that as well. You know, uh, public school systems did not want to be in a position of teaching uh, things that might blow up in their faces. And some of that is government and politics, yeah. right? So it's much safer to teach about Habitat for Humanity, right? right? It's a much, a much safer political place to be that the Board of Ed is not going to have, you know, uh, 1,500 people at the next meeting uh, protesting for them as well. So I think it, this is a complex mix of politics, of, uh, you know, boomer passions around what worked and what didn't work that, as you're saying, which is correct, has trickled down and has created a generation for whatever reason is distant from public policy and government. They have no connection to it whatsoever. Okay. So um, one of the things that we found in our focus groups um, was actually some pessimism towards like what a Facebook cause really does. Um, yeah. It's kind of a low barrier of entry right. that you just have to click to do it. And, and so what does it really mean? And I know that's a, that's a question that we struggle a lot with here. Right. Um, and kind of what I hear you saying is that where it really means something is either with donating money or donating time. Right. And so my question there is kind of the thing about voting is that everybody gets to do it. To donate money or time, you Unless have to have a certain it. amount of resources available to you. So yeah. what happens to those that millennials that don't have the ability to participate in that way? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, causes on Facebook, we were talking about this earlier today, I think it's this just enormously interesting new way of interacting because it brings all of these pieces together in one place. Um, and again, so nascent, we really don't know what all of it means. But one thing in millennials' favor in regards to the causes on Facebook is that it is very easy to participate doing the one thing that millennials feel is their commerce. Their commerce is the social network. And by connecting their friends to causes, they are being effective in, how, in, in their own view of um, what success is. So that issue of raising awareness for causes, um, blogging about them or putting it up on one's wall on Facebook about you know, uh, being a, a media voice for causes, is immediately available, is at no cost to every millennial, and is a heck of a lot easier, Stu can attest it is a heck of a lot easier than registering and voting in an awful lot of places uh, in America, right? So uh, I, I think part of what I was saying this morning is what I really don't want to do is take the evaluative frameworks <coughs> that um, are used on land, for, particularly for advocacy, and just transcribe them online because I think that this uh, that this new activity is so different. It really is deserving of, of new measures, new frameworks. And I don't even want to start with an idea of what that is because I think we just really need to watch it and feel it and talk to the participants more uh, to figure it out. I, I mentioned an example this morning. Uh, the Case Foundation funded over the holidays 
something called America's Giving Challenge. And they did this on the Parade Magazine website and on Facebook using causes. And the challenge was for the causes that raised the most money online, uh, the Case Foundation would give uh, awards, either $1,000 for the group that raised the most money in a day, for every day of the uh, challenge, and then I think it was $50,000 to the ultimate winner. And what was really fascinating was I have been in the cause and nonprofit space for a long time, longer than I want to uh, admit, and I had never heard of the top 10 uh, winners uh, of this. These were mainly groups that had no staff, uh, also groups that until the challenge didn't even have a Facebook presence. So it's not as if they were particularly facile on Facebook. And somehow, through the nature of this challenge and the nature of their social networks, they did phenomenally well, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars this way. And I have no idea why. I, don't, I have no idea why those groups, where an amnesty um, and a habitat did very poorly, and these groups no one had ever heard of, who have no staff, no budget, did phenomenally well. <coughs> so um, one of those organizations in the top ten was started by a friend of mine. And part of what we've discussed about this is how would he do in the next round? Yeah. Because now he's known, or now his organization is known. Right. And, um, and it's becoming bigger and sort of tips over that point of, you know, this is my buddy and he started this thing that's really cool. So what does he so say? What does he say? Why was he successful in the first round? What's that? Why was he successful in the first round? What does he think? Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is just the social network. You know, this is my friend. Right. He's really awesome. This is this really cool organization he started and they really need your help. Right. So what happens? Is it going to be a total turnover the next time it happens? And that goes back to what I was saying about group orientation versus individual orientation. People want to get on the cool new thing and like mm. you know, help out my help out my buddy versus this is a cause that I really, in and of itself, believe in. Hmm. I don't find that surprising. I, yeah. uh, I mean, we all know amnesty, and if we wanted to give amnesty money, we've done it already. And yeah. For them to say, hey, we need extra money right now. Hurry, hurry is not as compelling as someone who comes up with a new idea, a new cause, and says, I have a new approach to do I'd, I'd be more. But it's also you're going to give your buddy $5 the first time. But when they come back next time, you're going to say, all right, I did this last year. I did this. And I don't really that's, like you. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I didn't care about the cause. I was doing it because my friend sent me the link. <laughs> right. Didn't you just do that run for cancer with him? <laughs> yeah. Haven't they solved that whole cancer thing? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it is some mixture of these things going on. That's very interesting and new. Yeah. I, I'm from Argentina, where right now we're having a protest because the uh, government raised the export tax on on soybean and 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 the first uh, question I have for you is when you mentioned the hammer, yeah. because r right now no one is doing anything online around the conflict in Argentina. The internet might as well not exist. Things would be exactly the same. The farmers are stopping trucks on routes because they don't want the food to get to the to the cities, and government is is paying people to get the farmers to not let them stop the trucks. So it's a very feudal, medieval way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the internet is has no role. I've checked some Facebook groups, and they're really pitiful as far as numbers and and adherence compared to the whole country is pending on what this guy Jambia is from the uh, rural confederations and the lady president that we have are saying over the media. Mm -hmm. And so the internet is not existing. So what is the role of a hammer? When you mention the hammer, they want to do it with a hammer. Yeah. What do they do with a hammer yeah. I mean, without using any subterfuges, do, yeah. do they go smashing windows with a hammer, killing yeah. people, or? No, no. What I was referring there, and, and well, and, and let me, let me uh, be clearer about the focus of my work for this paper was yeah. U.S. focused. Okay. So what I was uh, referring to there was the natural inclination of young people to want to be hands-on volunteers for a cause more than participate in discussions of public policy or participating in government. So that was the distinction that I was making. Okay. I don't know that it, it uh, 
uh, translates that way overseas, uh, Bruce would know better uh, than I in that regard. You don't know either. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad we're on the same page. <laughs> Just say, man, I guess I think two things that, that contribute to the way in which the millennials differ, differ dramatically from previous generations are the way in which they think about two, two sort of social mechanisms. I think, and I guess I think one is the market. Um, I guess I think that the millennial generation believes more strongly in the market than than previous generations, and you know, very, I mean, they're they're not interested in you know you know they cite their parents as role models, like they're they're not interested in tearing things down. Right. You know, there there's a tremendous, and I think that the the activism you describe is all very entrepreneurial. Right. Like, and it's not it's not saying let's fundamentally shift the way in which we allocate resources, or it's 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 not sort of from an injustice framework. It's um it's from a you know. How can we sort of use the market to operate more? It's a lot of leveraging going yeah. on. Like yeah. I find it very interesting that that um that that Kiva organization, yeah. if I'm saying its name right, you know, is Kiva. is can't can't keep up with the number of people who want to, um, which is sort of what a micro finance organization. That's right. Small That's loans, right. like they um they can't keep up with the number of people who want to donate to that organization. Where you know they. And I think you speak to something very interesting that's going on that is spearheaded by young people, which is the blending of the for-profit and the nonprofit sectors. Right, so change.org and razoo.com are for-profit uh, enterprises. Kiva is a non-profit. There would be no way to, to know when you're just looking at them uh, online. Lots of young people are starting socially responsible businesses that in another era would have looked close to non-profits or starting non-profits that have revenue streams. So there is this very interesting uh, blending that's going on that at some point, uh, some of my colleagues have said the government probably needs to step in and readdress the tax issue on some of this as well. So the only thing I would just add to that is that um, I guess I think there are some negative possibilities mm -hmm. to, to having a generation that's, that's so, that believes that the world is fundamentally just. Yeah. Like, um, I think that there's... I think that there's some, some worry to that. Right. I think you've been waiting for a while. Just to follow up on that, what the gentleman said about the misunderstanding of the term hammer is exactly the crux of the problem, right? I mean, a number of us had a really interesting conversation a few months ago with a, a really interesting thinker named Zach Exley. Yeah. And he had, uh, was very critical of, of this generation that you describe in the U.S. and essentially saying that they're too comfortable. What you do when you build a house for habitat is doing nothing. It makes you feel good. You built that one house, but structurally, what are you doing to fight that injustice? And I think that's a really interesting strain of thought. Um, and what's interesting about Zach is that he ended up following the, um, the, he ended up kind of starting to study the Christian right and what they're doing to socially organize. Because he believed that while um, certain organizations on the left and universities were happy with people doing anything, totally agnostic to the content of that action. A lot of people in the in the um, evangelical community actually had far more content. Mm. And I think that's, I think you'll actually see, perhaps starting to see an interesting backlash against this idea of doing something, mm -hmm. whereas you're not necessarily having any kind of strategic any impact. impact. So there's it's kind of that um, that issue as well. Oh, that's a very interesting comment. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and I sort of follow up on Josh. I, as a consumer of these causes, yeah. like Facebook, Clicker, and a buyer, and all these things, I often think a lot of it is trend, and I wonder if we're going to see the bubble burst. And I think when that bubble bursts, it, it, that's when we're going to see which of the causes are the most valuable. And I'm, and I'm sort of thinking that that's happening now around the election. And what you said about the election being maybe this pivot point where we might see a change in how these causes are organized or even maybe linked from the online to the on land. Um, you know, the election is, is motivating people who have been linked on these causes on Facebook to actually go and do things. So then that brings me to the idea that has the percentage of the population that actually go out and do things, has that actually radically changed than from previous generations? You know, there are people who are entrepreneurship, entrepreneur about NGOs and so on and so forth. And maybe that's a new tool that they have nowadays, and they didn't have that then. But I wonder if, you know, what's actually happened is we're seeing a lot of volume, but again, we're not seeing a lot of substance. Well, we've certainly seen a huge increase, huge and steady increase in the number of volunteers. And this, again, is reflective of the in-school uh, mandatory volunteering programs. <coughs> that is sticking for people through college and beyond. So people have gotten in the habit of volunteering are, and are continuing. 
uh, the question of the content of that volunteering, I think, is is in flux, you know. But I do want to raise a, a caution in that I think of some of this as um, as community capacity as well. That when we're engaging people to do things that are, uh, you know, speak to their heart right now, and when they're facile and using the tools of democracy online, when something does happen in the future, uh, we're going to have these people to be ready to be mobilized I at a second's notice. You know, so maybe uh, it's very good news that we haven't had to mobilize in that way <laughs> to this point. We haven't had a challenge of that magnitude uh, yet. Uh, however, I think it's also good news that we would have the capacity uh, to organize and mobilize very quickly and very efficiently uh, if we needed to. Um, can you say anything about another dimension on this, which Josh's comment brings to mind, which is, which is uh, kind of leadership followership or leadership yeah. participation slash participation or something like that? Um, you know, a society that consists of lots of people who are, you know, eager to join whatever the latest, greatest right. thing is, but, you know, don't, um, uh, if I can use the term again, you know, think that much about what, you know, w what it is that they can do to uh, operate at a, you know, at a grander scale yeah. uh, or to mobilize, mobilize people themselves. Um, you know, that's not going to work. On the other hand, it may be exactly the opposite. That is to say that um, the fact that there have been these, you know, thousands of groups um, created um, uh, you know, maybe maybe a, a sign that there, we're getting lots more new leaders right. trained. Right. Um, I'm very familiar with the phenomenon, at, you know, in the college here, where you know, no self-respecting student would go through four years of Harvard without having founded a new organization. <laughs> this is like, a, right. this and is then, like, this is one of my great achievements. I was right. dean at. One of my great achievements was actually getting the two Republican clubs to, to merge, not as <laughs> not not as a Republican, if I'm not, but just as a as a exercise in in, in in instruction about how to actually make political change here, you know. So, so maybe that phenomenon is going on here. Right? We're just getting lots more people who are eager to lead things. But the yeah. the way you, you the, your most of your voiceover made it sound like it was more followership than leadership that was going on. Uh, I think that's interesting. I think what we're seeing is a tremendous amount of participation. Right. Um, but it's not the wild, wild west. It still does require leadership, but it's a new style of leadership. So it's not the top down. It's not the here's what you're going to do. I don't know who, if folks saw Al Gore announced a new web campaign yesterday for climate. And I thought it was just appalling. I really did. It was, we have all the solutions. Just click here, do what we tell you to do. There was no opportunity to engage people in a conversation about it or ask them for their ideas. So it, it requires a, a, a facilitative style of leadership uh, that uh, sets out goals uh, and helps people to move there without cutting off their opportunities to self-organize and develop their own uh, solutions. But one thing that you did mention that I think is an area of concern in the nonprofit sector, which is the um, access point has become, I think, too low. It's almost too easy to set up uh, an organization. And we have too many of them out competing for funds, competing for volunteers, and competing for just space. And I think that's problematic. Uh, I do. Now, there are people out there who are saying, well, wisdom of the crowds, we don't need organizations at all. And sometimes, given the number of organizations and the amount of noise they're making, I can tend to agree with them. However, uh, we do need organizations that can provide ongoing leadership, institutional memory, uh, research and expertise as needed, and organizing skills and training for communities. But those things are boring. <laughs> are boring. That's why boring. institutions yeah. have to do them, because institutions are boring. There's a, see, there's a little, <coughs> again, I'm going to throw out another sort oh, of yeah. inflammatory word, but that nobody's... <laughs> Nobody's used here. People talk about individual and all the rest of that stuff. It's a little narcissistic, actually. Some of this, some of some of the some of the tone of this, you know, that it's all about me and my hammer. You know, yeah, it's yeah, not a, it's yeah. not about anything. It's not about principles. It's not about movements. You know, in the you know leadership and all the rest of that. So so um, and all of that other stuff that you actually have to do, you know, to right. really create something enduring. Right. Um, it'll be interesting to see if. 
if, if this too can somehow be melded into the current trend. Yeah. So I, I was one of these narcissists when I first graduated. It was kind of the first first group of people kind of post nine. A reform narcissist, there we go. Right. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about Are that- Are you that reformed? Favorite reform. <laughs> 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 that is favorite reform. I just got a stinger missile. The interesting thing about that is that all my colleagues who started organizations in the year and a half after 9-11 are now all consultants. Yeah. yeah. And it's because of what I just said about the Habitat thing. They want scale. They want to figure out how yeah. to take that small organization they've yeah. so started. So that's not a bad thing. So that's, I don't, that's I don't right, actually right, think it is. Right. I think they're very conscious. And I think there's something that comes like two or three years after right. you start these organizations and realize that you need this, is that you really want to make an impact. You need that scale. Well, one of the things that's interesting will be to see what happens when this generation discovers that scale is government. Ah. <laughs> that, 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 that in effect, that's what you have to do. I, I think there's been a, 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 a mm. terrible failure of people who ought to be defending government to right. do so, and a terrible failure of them to articulate the public goods problem that only government can solve. Mm -hmm. You know, that there are that there are problems to which the market will not give you a solution. Oh, it just never will, oh. can't, won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But but the, but the, but but the, the rhetoric from the left and the right has been that government's your enemy, government's the problem, government right. is not, you know, it's just and and, and, and so the, 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 the fact that people aren't looking there you know, the, 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 you've been raised in the milieu where, 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 where nobody said you had to for certain kinds of problems. Um, and so I think that when that reemerges, re and it will, uh, when, when people kind of rediscover, oh, if we tear all of that apart, there's certain things we just will never accomplish, that they'll discover that that, that, that scale. Uh, a, a brief story, um, um, my son, I went to a, he gave a talk at school, he's a high school senior, he gave a talk at school this morning on reintegrating, you know, the importance of government and uh, getting involved in politics. So, Where so, come from? Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but it was, in, it was interesting to see, I think this election is, is giving a lot of people a, a, a return to that, partly yeah. just because even John McCain's rhetoric is not as relentlessly anti-government as, 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 as the Bush and, 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 and Reagan, and even to some degree Clinton was. Last question, though, is, is does the web give us a kind of a delay in that effect by providing this kind of fictive notion that we're doing it mm. without government? Uh, you know, and maybe in some cases, actually, it's non-fiction. Maybe it is doing it. But does the web, you know, if we're, if we're asking what is the role of the web in all of this, is, is you know, is, is the, the chatter around Facebook believe, making people believe that, oh, we are rebuilding New Orleans. Yeah. When, 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 in fact, you know, the, the, the private efforts have been nice, but they've been, you know, insufficient to, 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 to do what, what needs to be done. So I, I just throw that out as a question. Will, in fact, actually the process be slowed by the web, or does the web as an information distributor start to get the word out in ways that will, will make a difference? Right. Try, try, try building a dike one hammer at a, at a time. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> I want to pick up on, on Harry's mention of the word movement, which I think was the first time I heard that in this conversation. And I wanted to distinguish between just any kind of activism and actually building a movement. And I think we had this romantic vision of, especially the late 60s and 70s, of that being the height of, of getting changed in this country. But actually, that, that was kind of when movements turned into activism and it kind of turned into just rhetoric. And um, it, I, I wondered what Those are my people you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it took the civil rights movement decades of very, very careful strategic building and very slow building at that to actually get anywhere. And then, and then you had in the late 60s the idea that you can just have protests and suddenly change will happen. And it strikes me that we're holding like the millennials up to a, a higher standard than any previous generation has been held to before, which is that I don't think any generation has had even a a plurality of its participants actually engaged in a movement rather than activism. And because activism is so easy, I mean, everybody can do it. Building a movement requires, requires sacrifice, skill, actual time investment, all those kinds of things. And I'm not sure that there was any golden era when everybody was involved in a movement and that we're kind of patinaing our, our history with like, oh, there was a time when everybody was engaged and now suddenly we're in this nadir. When I, when I you know, uh, as one of Harry's students, you know, the, and, and involved in, in public service here on campus, there wasn't a year of, of, of kind of this more movement-oriented stuff when I was in college. There was like almost no organizations on campus that were focused on 
actually, and they were all service oriented, kind of like what you're saying about right. we were all taught to do service. It was after I graduated that suddenly you had like the, fair, uh, the, the all the different living wage campaigns pop up, and so it's it's not a it, you know it, it strikes me that yes, the majority of work at all times is going to be kind of this fluff of feeling good about yourself, but that like it's the, what's more interesting to me is that there is this kind of upsurge in the actual work, and even as, as a percentage of the total amount of stuff being done, it's small. I think it's a larger percentage now than it was when when you know when I was in college and and in the in the decades preceding that as well. And, and I'm wondering if we're holding up too high of a standard for how many people should are are supposed to be engaging all this. Yeah. Stuff. Well, certainly one thing I know for sure is that we're throwing around movement language uh, much too easily and and much too often uh, because uh, you know movements come along once in a generation and uh, almost every advocacy group. Uh, on their website right now, our activism group is using movement words. Um, I think what's very interesting is listening to Obama's language. It's laden with movement uh, words as well, which is very attractive to people who are uh, attracted to causes. And, and I think that that's purposeful. Uh, I really do. You know, I'm, I'm a, a data geek, and uh, um, so I find it really interesting to try to get down to the crux of who exactly is participating and you know what then are the outer concentric circles of people who may not be participating but are paying attention and uh, might be lending their good thoughts to it as well and it's always tiny yeah uh, it, it really is you know even in as you were saying in the, in the heyday of the 1960s it wasn't everybody participating although it was a significant uh, number and i think that's what we have to think about is what are these tipping points and who needs to participate how in order to move issues um, along but you know the, the, the interesting part of this work is that there is no one size fits all. And uh, you know every campaign is going to be different and every issue is going to be organized differently. I do think it is very important to recognize that young people are drawn to campaigns, not to institutions or organizations. And so if you are running an organization that is accustomed to having members um, and uh, ongoing um, participants, uh, you better find a new model because <laughs> young people are going to come and go as campaigns move them, which is a very different model. You can ask move on. They've, they've had to struggle with that uh, as well. I, I want to pick up on this point, uh, the gentleman made, that, that part of what I wondered earlier in your talk, Allison, was how much of this we're not interested in government would have been answered similarly in previous generations. But the amplifier of the new technology makes it sound like everything has changed when there may be a heavy generational aspect to this. And I, and I just I throw that in because that may be part of the mix. And I do think the longer you're involved with something, the more you realize we need to build this big infrastructure, this thing where all these people work together toward common goals. Oh, wait, that's government. We don't like that. But people <laughs> get to the point where they say, when we really want to do it big, it is government. And right. so the messaging around government, right. as you know, there's some interesting work on that these days. Right. But to fight off the government, is the 30 years of government is the problem, yeah. we need to say, here's what government does for you. It does these things you want to do. Yeah, well, you great society guys are going to get us there whether we want to or not, right? Kicking and screaming. <laughs> the, 60s, the 60s spirit died. The 60s spirit died when all of the people who said, don't trust anybody over 30, became 30. <laughs> you know, that's what happened to us. I think, I, I think a, an issue you bring up, though, Stu, that is very important, and it's one of the many, many cautions I've raised uh, today, is to try not to get... Um, uh, try to not to get too uh, moved by w what are unique characteristics of millennials versus what are characteristics of young people. Young people, right. Because right. right. yeah, some of this is young. Right about that. Right, and some of this, for instance, there was there's great criticism that uh, causes have gone up on Facebook. There are over 30,000 causes on there in less than a year, but very little money raised. Well, look at the constituency on Facebook. You know, college kids aren't going to give a lot of money uh, to causes. I think that that's a false measure. Uh, to use and unfair criticism of their passions and attention uh, to some of these issues as well. So it's not always clear which which is which and which is going to be a salient issue moving forward. But I think we need, do need to be cognizant of remembering that these are young people who are creating their own identities right now. Since you identify yourself as a data geek, I'm curious to yeah. what extent um, some of these millennial characteristics are partly because of a population boom. Yeah. You know, because I grew up with no friends because there was no religion on my block. <laughs> right. Like, 
there was literally nobody in my school my age who was like, I just wanted to graduate from class. Eugene, that's yeah. what they told you. There wasn't enough of us to actually get together to do anything right. because we were crushed by the, by the population ahead of us and the population behind us. I want to tell you something. I'm so glad you raised that. I want to tell you something that Peter Levine at University of Maryland told me, which I thought was so interesting. And he said, this looking at the surge of youth voting is extremely misleading because what you're looking at is a surge of youth, yeah. mm -hmm. right? There is just a larger number of 18-year-olds than there ever has been. And in those states in particular, where voting and civic engagement has always been high in, say, a Minnesota, those young people are participating at the same levels that their parents and grandparents did. Mm -hmm. So uh, it does require, uh, I think, uh, a greater sensitivity to the fact that we are just looking in some ways at just an enormous generation of people. But also, we have to know as they're moving along, like the boomers, they're going to be, there's going to be a great wake uh, behind them <laughs> as they're changing society. So, yeah. I thought like, these, these points about sort of, is it, you know, are these, are, is this generation really any different? Like, um, you know, or, or is there any, or is there a greater or lesser percentage of people in, involved? I, mean, I do think you, you sort of brought up that phrase, don't trust anyone over 30. Um, I mean, I guess I think at least that, that mantra existed, you know, mm -hmm. in the 60s. And I feel like now the mantra is almost the reverse. Like, it's almost, you know, let's, yeah, yeah. No, let's, you're right. you know, let's, yeah, trust, let's trust the older generation to do, to do right. Like, I, um, hmm. you know, I mean, I really do. Like, I think. Um, really? I, I Are did you up for promotion or something? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I, I did a little bit. I did a little bit of research um, when, when the fair wage campaign, when the hunger strike happened at Harvard last last year. I did a little bit of research on how um, how the rest of the campus reacted to the hunger strikers, and um, mm. and and the majority of the campus seemed to be saying seemed to be saying like who like who are we to you know let's trust the administrators to you know to make the right decision on this That's and. Just Harvard. Uh, you know, you know, maybe, it's a special case. maybe that is. But, but, uh, were they saying it because they really believed it, or yeah, was it saying it because they didn't want to deal with it, that's, and that was a great cover? So, up. I mean, I guess, I guess potentially apathy would be you no. Know, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not sure about the cause underlying <laughs> that, but I do think that there's there's this amazing trust for for the older generation that. Um, that's interesting. I, yeah, it's, that's a that's I think in part a. Uh, it, it's not just Harvard, mm -hmm. but it 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 probably um, does. It's probably a phenomenon that's enhanced by the selection mechanism mm -hmm. that it takes to get into a selective college. Sure. Would be my guess. That people sort of follow the rules in general. I, mean, I think if you yeah. if you if you you know went into some inner city neighborhood and talked to people in the same age group, where most of whom are going to be lucky to go to community mm -hmm. college, you might not feel exactly the same. Get, exact, get the same reaction. But it, but it also is reflective of this is not a rebellious generation. They yeah. are they are friendly with their parents right. because they want to make sure they have some place to move back home to. I think <laughs> that's that's what no, I was going right. to raise up. Which is you also uh, one of the one of the things not really put on the table yet is the is the role of economics mm -hmm. and the economic basis of these kids' lives, right. which yeah. is is essentially parent fed still to to right. to a degree that is that is. Uh, uh, you know, un, uh, new, <laughs> but, but but new. I mean, you know, the, each generation that comes along gets a little 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 more parent uh, care and feeding. But this one, this one is you know, there's enough prosperity at the at the parental level to really allow uh, a, a, a long, long, long delay before before you enter into uh, you know economic self sufficiency. And well, and a dimming job outlook mm -hmm. for young people and an increasing debt load for them as well. This is not a carefree uh, but, generation and No, but, but it's but it's one who, who as you rightly say, you know, that we need someplace to uh, mom and dad are still writing checks. Yeah. Well, uh, and, 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 and who are we to distrust who's writing our check? The, mo the, mo the most obvious point about volunteerism is that you actually have to have money in order to do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier. You don't have to. You don't have to, but it, you know, they, <laughs> Particularly this Helps. style, particularly if you're getting on an airplane and flying to Guatemala, someone right. had to pay for this. Some of this is style. Some, some you don't, you know, some you can do on a Sunday afternoon right? or do online, right? Yeah. I wonder then, we talk about how things need to scale up to big government, but what about local government? You yeah. Know, you often see in your own community that the trends I see in the causes that I'm aware of is that they're a lot more international. And so people are taking their effort that they maybe would have geared towards policy change and said, okay, I'm going to go to Guatemala, or I want to know what's going on in Iran or China. And then they're also more local. So like people feel they can actually change, there is change in government, they can change their local politicians. And I feel like there's more engagement on that level. Is that, is that I didn't see that uh, in the research that I did. In fact, I saw 
a great disdain for local uh, government. And what you see is such a huge increase in either vacancies in local government positions uh, or um, uh, no competition for running, uh, which really is a sign of neglect, I think, more than anything else. I hope I hope you're right, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So one last yeah. I, as far as you raised before, you said you just, and I thought the comment you made about the idea that this was building capacity for some unforetold future mobilization was yeah. an interesting one. Um, I guess I wonder what it will, I mean, maybe the Obama campaign is the tip of that iceberg in the sense that a, mo a mobilization behind a form of idealistic change has finally been packaged in a sufficiently attractive way that people under 30 are willing to buy in um, and contribute a little more time, effort, investment. Um, but on the other hand, I do wonder, I mean, the, the degree to, I mean, the indicators that the United States is entering sort of some kind of political financial crisis, have been building for quite some time. Um, you know, 1% of the population is in prison. We're getting close to 10% on food stamps. Um, I mean, this is a very dysfunctional system that uh, has been going on for a while. So I, I guess I wonder what kind of crisis, would the crisis have to be packaged equally well? Um, or what, what will it take before you know, people get beyond the donating $20 to the Obama campaign to building the kind of sort of alternative state, maybe, that Oliver's envisioning yeah. uh, made up of moveon.org like and affiliated <laughs> organizations. Boy, I'd hate to have to prophesize about Armageddon, but I think certainly if when we're looking at uh, very, very high levels of unemployment has historically been uh, a reason for um, uh, mass organizing and uh, protest. Uh, a certainly draft. And, yeah, a military but, draft would do it. Yeah, that, that, that's another, what did it for us. Or, <laughs> or another attack, you know, uh, might be as well. I think, I think what's going to be very interesting to see, though, is uh, beyond the 08 election, so beyond what has become the opera of the Bush administration, regardless of what side you're on, what has happened is the passions have been inflamed for and against uh, in such a loud, raucous way uh, that once that catalyst is gone, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how much people are participating and paying attention uh, afterwards. Uh, you know, I hope that there is an opportunity to engage and get to some systemic uh, conversations about change. Um, but I do want to say, you know, from if we took, if we went up 10,000 feet, and looked at this historically, I think once you get from 9-11, you know, through the debacle of this war and take that out of the equation, I wonder what's there for people to be passionate about at that public level. And, and that does speak to your, you know, your question uh, directly. Yeah. Right? No, I share the question. <laughs> So basically, I didn't answer it, but I <laughs> spent a long time on it. <laughs> yeah, no, I wonder what. Anyone else? Well, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate your input and your uh, help. I'm going to stay this afternoon to continue to talk about some of these issues as well. The paper for the Case Foundation will be coming out in the next month or so, and I'll be sharing the uh, the link so you all can see that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Tell me your name again. I'm sorry. Scott.